I preach this morning in the name of God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we continue today with Act 5, Act 5 of the great drama that is the story of the Bible. The Word has become flesh. The author has become a character in his own story. The hero has taken center stage and begins to move right into people's lives. Now last week, we saw how Jesus moved into the lives of three individuals. John the Baptist, the woman at the well, and Nicodemus. Last week was about Jesus' private conversation with individuals. This week is about Jesus' public ministry with the crowd. How Jesus moves into the lives of all people in general. Now, there is a lot of ground to cover in our lesson today. And so I'll cover it in three main headings. Jesus preaching in parables, Jesus miracles and wonders, and how various people responded and reacted to him. So let's take a look at Jesus preaching first, which is, after all, only appropriate because Jesus is the Word of God made flesh. So we would expect him to preach God's Word. And Jesus is the Messiah, the long-expected King, and so we would expect him to preach about God's kingdom. But what we don't expect, what we don't expect is just how difficult it is to understand what Jesus preaches, even when he gives it to us straightforwardly, as he does in the Sermon on the Mount. Let's take a look. It's on page 340, page 340 in your copy of the story, and we'll pick it up with the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, which begin that sermon. Page 340 in the middle, and they go like this. <coughs> Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's beautiful language. Beautiful, beautiful language. But if you look at it, it's kind of crazy. I mean, Jesus stands up and he says, follow me and I will give you poverty. I will give you hunger. I will give you thirst. I will give you persecution. Who wants to follow a king like that? Who wants to live in a kingdom like this? A kingdom where everything has been turned upside down. Unless, of course, it's the world that's upside down and the kingdom that's right side up. Now remember that Jesus is the Son of God come down from heaven. And heaven is the place where everything is right side up. The place where everything is the way it's supposed to be. Jesus is the Word of God. The Word of God takes center stage and He tells us straightforward in no uncertain terms that it's our world that's got it wrong. It's our world that's got it backwards. It's our world that's upside down. And Jesus has come to turn it right side up again. And so Jesus has come to teach us the truth. Jesus has come to show us the way, the right way that we are to live, how we can live right side up in an upside down world. How we can live a blessed life. A life where character counts more than contentment. And that means that we should embrace the struggle because those are the things that bless us. Those are the things that make us strong. And help us live the right way even when things are going wrong. You know, as I've taken my prayer walks these last few months, I've spent a lot of time reflecting on just how far God has brought me and how much God has changed me in these last five to six years. And these last five to six years have been some of the most difficult in our life. We've had some really hard choices to make for us my family. We've made some hard decisions to come to. There have been months of uncomfortable and uncertain waiting. I've had to do some really unpleasant things. And yet, looking back on it, God has blessed me through them all. God has changed me through that struggle. God has changed me and made me a better man today than I was five or six years ago. And I know, knowing the decisions and choices I have yet to make, I know God will make me a better man five or six years in the future than I am today. That's how God works. God works through the struggle. When we are weak, God blesses us. When we are hungry, God fills us. When we, when we are thirsty, God gives us something to drink. When we mourn, God leads us to joy. That's how God works. It's 
through the struggle, shaping our character, shaping us so that we can live in his kingdom, so that we can live the right way in a world that has been turned upside down. And what are you struggling with today? What difficulties are you going through today? And will you let God bless you in them? Will you let God use those circumstances and those difficulties to turn your world right side up again? No matter how difficult or how painful it might be. You see, what Jesus has to tell us about the kingdom is not easy to hear. Which is why Jesus' usual way of teaching about the kingdom is not the straightforward preaching of the Sermon on the Mount, but it's the roundabout preaching of the parables, which conceal the truth from us and then challenge us to come and find it. And the parable that explains them all is the parable of the sower. It's found on page 335, the bottom of page 335 in your copy of the story. Let's take a look. Jesus says, Now the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may see but never be perceiving. They may hear, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. And Jesus said, don't you understand this parable? Well, then how can you understand any parable? And Jesus tells his disciples straight up, I'm teaching you parables to hide the truth from people so that they have to come looking for it, find it. And now in the parable of the sower, the sower goes out to sow, who is, of course, Jesus Christ. The seed that is sown is the word of God. The seed falls on different types of soils, the word falls on different types of ears. And it's only the good soil, it's only the listening ears that receive the seed, that receive God's word, so that it puts down roots in your heart and soul and bears the fruit of a changed life. And Jesus tells us, Jesus challenges us to be that good soil, to have those listening and open and receptive ears, middle of page 336. If anyone has ears to hear, says Jesus, let them hear. He challenges us to wrestle with what he says, to engage with what he says, to work with what he says. And it takes work. You've got to work at it. You've got to pray about it. You've got to think about it. You've got to reflect on it. But it is worth it. Because there is good news to be found in the parables. Good news about a God who comes down from heaven to find us. That the God who made us, the God who loves us, the God who wants us back has sent his son Jesus Christ to come and find us. And good news, that when Jesus finds us, there is joy in the kingdom. And he rejoices over us like a shepherd over his lost sheep, like a woman over her lost coin, like a father over his lost son. God's good world may have been turned upside down. But the good news is that God himself has come into this world to turn it right side up again. And there is joy. Joy in the kingdom when God does that. There is joy when the king finds you. And if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear, because this is about you. If anyone has eyes to see, let them see. And that brings us to the second point I want to talk about today. The second way that Jesus moved right into the lives of people. And that was through his wonders and his miracles which confirmed the message of his preaching and parables, which showed people what life in the kingdom looked like, which showed people the power of the king. And there's the power of the king over nature, like the stilling of the storm on the Sea of Galilee. And you know, just four weeks ago, some of us in this room here right now actually sailed on that Sea of Galilee. It was an outstanding opportunity, great trip. And when we were on the Sea of Galilee just four weeks ago, Rami, who is you know, his brother-in-law, Rami show was telling us, he showed us how the ravines and the valleys on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, how they, they naturally funnel the wind so that the wind comes shooting out onto the surface of the water like a, a nozzle shoots the water out of a garden hose. And so storms can whip up on the Sea of Galilee just like that, coming out of nowhere. Now Jesus didn't still every storm on the Sea of Galilee. But he did still the storm on the Sea of Galilee that day. And the Sea of Galilee is an example of the world at large. You see, the world is fallen and broken too. Nature is fallen and broken too. Just as surely as human nature is, 
So nature is fallen and broken too. Things in nature are not the way they are supposed to be. There is violence, there is chaos, there is unpredictability, there is violence. Floods and storms, hurricanes and droughts, tornadoes. Two weeks ago, a series of tornadoes tore through the south. One of them went right through the town of Paducah, Kentucky. And a church preschool found itself in the middle of that path. Now, just like that storm on the Sea of Galilee, this tornado came up just like that, so suddenly, that the preschool teachers had no time to do anything about it, no time to do anything but to take their children and hurry them into a room. And then to try to calm them down, the, the teachers had them sing, Jesus loves me this time. The tornado, the tornado hit the church, tore the roof right off the church. But the room where the kids were sitting wasn't touched, and not a single child was hurt. Jesus still has the power to still the storms. Jesus has power over nature. And our king has power over the supernatural, too. When that boat got to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus got out of the boat, cast a legion of demons out of a man, and sent them into a herd of swine. Now the supernatural world has fallen as well. Just as human nature is, just as the natural world is, so the supernatural world has fallen too. God is the maker of all that is, of all things, both seen and unseen. God made the angels, God made the spirits, and God made them to worship and to serve Him just like us. Now, just like us, not all of them do. But unlike us, all of them, even those who are fallen and rebellious against them, all of them acknowledge God's existence and recognize Jesus' power and authority over them. We know who you are, the Holy One of God, they say. And you know who they are too. You know who they are too. They are the malevolent forces of evil in this world. Unseen, but felt. Piling on us when we are down. Pulling us astray into temptation and sin. And yet they have to leave us alone in Jesus' name. Because the King has power over them. Power over the natural world. Power over the supernatural world. Power over sickness and death. Jesus healed the sickness of a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years. And Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. Now, unlike Jesus, Jairus' daughter is not alive now. She died, and then she rose from the dead, but then she died again. She's dead now, as we all one day will be. And that is part of this upside-down world, too. That is part of the curse, the fallen nature that we live in. But this miracle shows us that Jesus has power over sickness and death. And that means that sickness and death do not get the last word Jesus does. And that word is Talitha Kumi, my child, I say to you, arise. And Jesus will say that to you when he comes again. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear and if anyone has eyes to see, let them see. And there were many who did. Many who did. Middle of page 346. Middle of page 346. The crowd was amazed and they said, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisee said, No, nope, it's by the prince of demons that he cast out demons. And that brings me to my third and final point of how people responded to Jesus and reacted to him, how people responded to Jesus and reacted to him. There's King Herod, who had every advantage. I mean, King Herod heard God's word through the greatest of God's prophets, John the Baptist. King Herod saw the work of God through the hand of Jesus Christ. And yet, for all of that, King Herod thought that God was out to get him. Bottom of 346. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. And that's a guilty conscience of work. But that's what a guilty conscience does. It digs up the past, brings it back to life to haunt you now in the present. And so you've got to confess your wrongdoing and give it to Jesus. Take the wrong things you have done, confess them, put them on Jesus' shoulder, let Jesus take them to the cross, let Jesus bury them in the tomb, and they will stay buried in the tomb of Jesus you will be set free of them. Amen. Amen. Now Herod should have known that because he heard God's word. He saw God's work. And Herod had neither eyes to see nor ears to hear. Peter had them both. 
Peter saw Jesus walking on the water. Peter heard Jesus say to him, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked in. Now, to be sure, you know, after three, four, five steps, Peter slid beneath the waves. But let us not forget that there are only two people in all of human history who have ever walked on water, and Peter's one. And when the disciples saw it, the power that Jesus had himself, the power that Jesus could give to Peter, the power that Jesus had over nature when he stilled another storm on the Sea of Galilee, yet again, when the disciples saw it, they said, you are the Son of God. Peter and the disciples had eyes to see, they had ears to hear, so did the crowd in the feeding of the 5,000, only they let their stomachs get in the way. Now Jesus fed the 5,000, the Bible tells us, in a remote place. Four weeks ago, a number of us were at that place. It's a lovely place. Lovely place. Just over the hill from the Sermon on the Mount, not too far away at all. It is a lovely place. And there in that place, there in that place, Jesus fed the 5,000 in a remote place, just like his father fed the Israelites in the wilderness. There in that place, top of page 348, Top of 348, Jesus had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and so Jesus played the good shepherd to them. Middle of 348, and then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass beside the still water of Galilee, and Jesus prepared a table for them so that their cups and their baskets overflowed. The feeding of the 5,000 is one of Jesus' greatest miracles. It is certainly Jesus' most public miracle. And it is the only miracle, the only one, that is recorded in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The feeding of the 5,000 made a strong and lasting impression upon people because they heard Jesus' word. They saw Jesus' miracle. They even tasted it with their stomachs. And yet, they didn't get it. Because they went away and they came back the next day bringing their family and friends with them, asking Jesus to do it again. Hey, God, see, God, see this. Look what this guy can do. And Jesus said, no, no way. Bottom of 349. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me. Not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. You see, the crowd was only looking for something spectacular, a trick. If Jesus was not going to give them something spectacular, what Jesus wanted to give them was something sacramental. Bottom of page 350. And Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink, and that's really not what the crowd came to hear. So they turned, they turned away from Jesus, and they walked away. What about you? Will you walk away from Jesus? Or will you let Jesus come right into your life? And one of the highlights of the Holy Land trip for me was celebrating communion in the place where Jesus fed the 5,000. That was our worship on Sunday morning, the very first week we were there. And what joy. I mean, for a pastor, what joy to celebrate communion in that place. What joy to give my people bread and wine in the same place where Jesus gave them the loaves and fishes. What joy to give my people the body and blood of Jesus in the very place where Jesus said, whoever eats my flesh, whoever drinks my blood has eternal life. What joy to celebrate communion in that place. And yet communion is no different in this place. You don't have to go halfway around the world to meet Jesus. Because Jesus comes down from heaven to meet you. And Jesus comes down from heaven to meet you and he promises to meet you where he promises to be. Here in his word and in the bread and wine of communion. He says, this is my body. This is my blood given for you. And whoever eats my flesh, whoever drinks my blood, has eternal life. And I will raise him on the last day. The kingdom of God has come in Christ. And the direction of the kingdom is always from the top down. From heaven, 
through Jesus to you. And God is at work right now in this service through his word. God is at work right now to bring you to Jesus and through him into his kingdom. God is at work right now to turn your life upside down, to bless you and make your life the way it's supposed to be. The kingdom of God has come in Christ. The Word became flesh. The author became a character in his own story. The hero has taken center stage. You hear his preaching and his parables. You see his miracles and his wonders. You even taste the bread and the wine. Jesus Christ comes off stage and right into the story of your life. Do you have ears to hear him? Do you have eyes to see him? Do you have a heart who wants him? And will you let him come in? How will you react to him? How will you respond to him? What will you do? Reach out. Reach out. And grab hold of the hand that has come down from heaven to find you. And if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you and we praise you that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, into this world to find us, to turn our world upside down and make it right side up again. Lord God, come to us. By your grace, open our ears that we might hear. By your grace, open our eyes that we might see you at work around us. By your grace, give us soft hearts that are good soil for your word. And Jesus, come into our hearts. Come into our lives, put your roots into our lives, bear the fruit of a changed life, and Jesus, use us as your servants in this place. For that is why you have come, and we pray, thy will be done, thy kingdom come, here and now, in this place. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.